Morning, everyone. So we have two folks who just popped onto the screens uh, for you, Ariel Tron and Dennis Chestnut. And they'll be speaking to us in a second, but let me just give them some their, some kudos that they deserve. Uh, for Ariel, as a director of river restoration programs, Ariel at the Anacostia Watershed Society oversees our youth, uh, the youth and adult programs there. On any given day, and I've seen this firsthand, you might see her um, outside um, working with canoes, and she also might be in our classroom teaching students about impervious services, leading a group of seventh graders, or on a canoe trip, planting wild rice with fourth graders in the mud flats of Kenilworth Marsh. She serves on the Prince George's County, that's in Maryland, Public Schools Environmental Literacy Steering Committee, Mid-Atlantic Environmental Literacy Work Group, and on the board of the DC Environmental Education Consortium. As a native Michigander who grew up swimming in crystal clear lakes and rivers, Ariel is passionate about making sure everyone has access to clean water. And Dennis, her co-keynote, is a native Washingtonian, a lifetime member of Ward 7, which is right near the river. He's a master carpenter, vocational educator by profession, but is dedicated to the youth in development, community improvement, and civic duty has led to his involvement with many civic, civic and conservation projects. Growing up in the far northeast section of Washington, D.C., he became Dennis became connected to many green spaces, parks, streams, and the Anacostia River, where he learned to swim as a child. Um, he has appeared in numerous publications, video documentaries that highlight his work on restoring the health of the Anacostia River and improving the east of the, east of the river communities, developing high quality use programs. Among um, his many accomplishments, he was the founding executive director of Groundworks Anacostia uh, River, on the Anacostia River. And the keynote project that many have seen, if you live in the area, is managing the litter traps and removing tons, literally tons of trash and debris from the Anacostia River. Um, Ward 7, if you haven't been here lately, um, and the areas east of the Anacostia have been described as the greenest ward in, in Washington, D.C., outside of the National Mall. But it's also where some of the most environmentally challenging conditions in the city exist, which you'll hear about. This is the reason why Dennis has become committed to restoring the health of the river, improving the natural resources located at this community and throughout the city, and connecting residents, schools, businesses, civic and community organizations to the many outdoor resources and national envir natural environmental um, projects through tangible on the, on the ground issues that change places and change lives. So I, I'd like to have you hear from Ariel and Dennis. Welcome, you guys. Good morning. Thank you. All right, Dennis, I'm going to share the screen here with the presentation. All right, okay. Wonderful. And um, I'll uh, prompt you when to change it. Okay, wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dennis Chestnut, and uh, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to uh, speak and share uh, with you all this um, morning uh, to discuss something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is uh, uh, the Anacostia River, and more importantly, reclaiming and restoring the health of the Anacostia River. Uh, you see that uh, I have listed that, uh, of course, you heard my uh, bio, but uh, I'm, I'm retired from, um, from those organizations I was involved with, but uh, I now am... Uh, still serving, you retire from, from jobs, but you don't retire from the work that you do to restore the health. So um, my uh, role at this present time is what uh, I refer to as a civic ecology practitioner. And, and just uh, very simply, uh, what that means is uh, I uh, focus on broken things, just as I do as a carpenter and repair and bring those things, restore those to, to use. I also um, uh, identify and work on broken places. And in the process of, of doing the work 
to uh, uh, repair those broken places. Uh, that's what I refer to as my uh, civic ecology work. Next slide. So uh, the Anacostia River uh, is uh, Washington DC's neighborhood river. And the reason I refer to it as DC's neighborhood river is because uh, the Anacostia River runs north and south through Washington DC uh, from um, uh, the uh, suburban areas of Maryland and Montgomery County and runs into the uh, Potomac River at our southern end of the city. Uh, a lot of people, uh, when they think of Washington, D.C., and you ask them about a river, they would uh, naturally say uh, the Potomac because it has had most of the uh, attention and focus. But the Anacostia River is really uh, Washington, D.C.'s river. So we refer to it as our neighborhood river, and I personally refer to the Anacostia as my neighborhood river because I've lived on uh, in this area and, and within walking distance of the river all my life and uh, have, have very personal connections to it. Next slide. So one thing about rivers, uh, uh, in, in especially in urban areas and in cities around the world, uh, you know, rivers are assets. Uh, rivers uh, serve a number of purposes. Uh, of course, they're a great natural resource uh, as it relates to um, uh, subaquatic life um, and all the things associated with uh, having a waterway uh, located in your uh, uh, in proximity to where you live. Um, but the uh, uh, the rivers uh, also are assets in various other ways. Okay, next slide. Uh, we have uh, uh, dynamic waterfronts. As a matter of fact, um, you know we see the celebrations that take place along our waterfronts, uh, such as the uh, 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 Independence Day uh, celebrations, uh, the uh, New Year's around the world. They generally uh, uh, have tremendous celebrations around the waterfront. So waterfronts are something that people really enjoy, and we're fortunate to have a a uh, vibrant waterfront down on the southern end of our city uh, that is uh, just made tremendous progress over the decades. Next slide. Uh, boating recreation is another one of those things that uh, is definitely one of the uh, 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 prizes that come along with having access to a river, uh, whether that's canoeing or kayaking, um, maybe a John boat or uh, even the uh, recreational uh, uh, boats are very uh, uh, important assets to uh, recreation on the river. Next slide. One thing about uh, uh, the Anacostia, uh, fortunately, uh, we have, um, as I described earlier, very developed end of the river on our southern end. Um, that's where the Washington Nationals baseball stadium is located. Uh, we have a, a world-class uh, soccer facility there now um, with our uh, uh, professional soccer team. And, uh, and also uh, a very vibrant waterfront where water taxis, uh, marinas, other things are located. But we also have um, on our Northern end of the river, uh, some tremendous uh, natural uh, areas uh, where uh, it's abundant uh, wildlife, uh, birds, uh, eagle are now nesting there. Uh, you could forget that you're actually located in the city if you uh, get a chance to uh, travel uh, in that portion of the river. And that's the portion of the river closest to the area uh, where uh, I live and the area that we refer to as Ward 7. Okay, you can, next slide. Uh, one of the things that uh, is uh, also enjoyable about, about rivers is uh, fishing. And of course, kids like to fish. I was introduced to fishing as a child and, and it's, it's been a lifelong uh, hobby of mine. And uh, that's one of the things that fortunately uh, rivers uh, provide for uh, that type of recreation. Uh, and if um, need be, to provide uh, uh, sustenance in various ways. Next slide. 
Uh, I described paddling earlier, and uh, if you'll take a look at this slide, uh, quiet paddling. I mean, it's uh, in, in these stressful times, I can't think of anything that would probably be more uh, relaxing uh, than uh, kayaking or canoeing or, or just a quiet paddle on the Anacostia. Next slide. Now, outdoor education, which you'll hear quite a bit uh, more about from um, our Ariel, but outdoor education is very important. And uh, we are fortunate to have um, uh, our uh, municipal governments, uh, both in uh, Washington, DC and in the surrounding suburbs that support uh, outdoor education and uh, uh, building stewardship among our young people and the general uh, residential population. So. Outdoor education is a key uh, component of, uh, of our work. Next slide. Biking along the Anacostia, healthy exercise I refer to here. I'm not sure whether you recognize a couple of those gentlemen that are in this picture. One is uh, the former um, uh, Department of Interior uh, uh, Director, uh, uh, Secretary of Interior rather, um, uh, Secretary Salazar and the uh, senator from uh, Maryland, uh, Senator uh, Cardin. And we had uh, an opportunity to open a new trail that runs the length of the Anacostia called the Anacostia River, River Walk Trail. And I um, was able to catch this, uh, this photo of these uh, two dignitaries enjoying uh, our, our River Walk Trail. Next slide. River music, uh, whether it's, uh, we'll call it river music, but uh, when, when there are opportunities to bring people to the river, this is another one of those uh, kinds of activities that are, are really important to draw people to the river. It brings people together uh, in an enjoyable setting. And uh, we've had the opportunity to uh, create some of those kinds of opportunities and look forward to doing that more along the river, uh, the Anacostia in DC. Uh, next slide. But I, I, you know, all of those things are wonderful and great, but there is uh, some bad news and I'd like to bring to your attention is why we do this work. Next slide. Of course, there are um, uh, sewage. Uh, there's, there's something that we have in the city called a combined sewer overflow system, um, which means that uh, in heavy rains, uh, the uh, uh, raw sewage uh, combined with the stormwater uh, releases and in empty into the Anacostia River, which is, uh, uh, which, which for, for decades prov uh, provided a great deal of pollution and uh, had a tremendous impact on uh, the subaquatic life and uh, the ability to uh, use the river in all of the ways that the river should be used. Uh, next slide. Uh, that includes this uh, uh, main culprit uh, uh, runoff, you know, from uh, rooftops to uh, roadways, uh, automobiles are, are, are releasing a lot of uh, toxins and um, those uh, pollutants enter the river, that nasty stuff right uh, through the uh, runoff into our uh, uh, stormwater system. Next slide. Uh, toxics in the river, uh, in the Anacostia River, also are a result of uh, some old industrial legacy uh, uh, projects that uh, exist along the river. Uh, there have been five uh, identified uh, hot spots um, from uh, the southernmost point uh, at Poplar Point, where uh, at one point there were uh, agricultural uh, greenhouses that supplied um, things to the federal government. Uh, to the uh, uh, Navy Yard, uh, which uh, was involved in shipbuilding at one point, as well as a weapons plant and things of that nature, uh, to the uh, uh, commercial facilities, a gasification facility that was operated by the uh, Washington uh, Gas Company, and uh, further up the river to the uh, uh, Pepco Power Plant, the Potomac Electric Power Company power, 
power generating plant. And, uh, and then to the uh, uh, Kenworth landfill, which was the city's municipal dump um, for, uh, for decades from 1942 until 1970 when uh, that landfill was uh, closed. Um, you know, just a point of note, uh, when that landfill was operating um, uh, in the 1960s, it was uh, estimated that up to uh, 250,000 tons of trash and debris were burned in that uh, landfill uh, on an annual basis. So it was really a, a, a very bad place. Um, and contributed to uh, toxins in the river that had other impacts. Next slide. The next slide. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Okay. Uh, do we have a freeze? Okay. It might be frozen. I can see if I can it pull may... it up. Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, while we're waiting for that uh, next slide to come up, I will say that um, the, uh, uh, the power generating plant is now just a transmission plant. It does not um, um, generate power from that plant any longer. And uh, the uh, open burning that uh, was taking place in the landfill up until 1970 uh, move to a uh, uh, to a burning operation that uh, that the Pepco power plant actually uh, well the city uh, they, they burned the trash in a um, in a facility rather than in the open landfill. Uh, one of the things that that did, of course, uh, was uh, stop the burning in the open landfill, but uh, those toxins were still spewed into the uh, atmosphere, polluting the water as well as the air. And um, of course, uh, uh, PCBs was one of the worst. Next slide. And uh, you, this, we've, I've purposely uh, kind of dulled this. This is a, 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 a photo of, of our canary in the mine, so to speak. Uh, the catfish, the bottom feeders, uh, we're exhibiting some um, some very uh, hideous kinds of um, uh, characteristics as a result of the pollutants that were in the sediment at the bottom of the river. As you know, catfish are uh, bottom feeders and therefore um, uh, had the most impact from uh, the pollutants that were located uh, in the sediment in the river. Next slide. Now, uh, there are also uh, some serious uh, human health effects. And, uh, and as you see, uh, those human health effects have uh, the greatest impact on our most vulnerable uh, populations. And this is one of the reasons I have these young people uh, uh, pictured here. This is an effort of looking to bring young people uh, to the river, the uh, river education, uh, to uh, build stewardship among them because they're going to be the ones that's going to have to carry this forward into the future. But uh, serious uh, human health effects result from the kinds of activities that were uh, taking place uh, along the river. Next slide. But we are in the process of cleaning it up. Uh, one of the efforts that um, have been made by not just uh, the organization I led, uh, but Anacostia Watershed Society, of course, and the many other organizations who uh, uh, participate in this work uh, throughout the Anacostia uh, watershed. And uh, we've had some tremendous uh, uh, results. Uh, some of those you'll hear about in the uh, following presentation uh, when Ariel presents. But... Um, Two things we uh, focused on doing. One was uh, what we call turn it around, turn it around from the kind of uh, river that uh, people could not use to uh, the kind of river that uh, would draw people to it and people would use. We also um, did something we call restory. 
we restoried uh, the, the river so that people would uh, uh, buy into uh, the river as an asset rather than some place to stay away from. Next slide. One of the things that, um, that you heard about was the uh, litter capturing devices and um, the river was so clogged with um, plastic bottles, trash and debris that um, it was necessary to take uh, some, some really drastic actions. Next slide. So uh, a bag bill was uh, what's, what was referred to as the Anacostia River uh, Cleanup and Protection Act was passed uh, led by uh, a former city council member, Tommy Wells. And uh, this uh, uh, was a, uh, a result of of, of some acts that, but this was a municipal city government passed act that uh, put a, a fee on, uh, on plastic bags and uh, resulted in uh, funds being generated that could sustain the work that was being done along the river. Um, and and this, this is uh, something that has uh, had tremendous impact on, uh, on the cleanup. Next slide. So, this, uh, the, this photo, as you can see, is of a young child uh, somewhere in the area of around, I would say, three years old. And um, I have this picture here because in the next three years, uh, uh, when we should be able to uh, have the Anacostia River in a, in a uh, fishable and swimmable condition in various portions of it. Uh, we've moved to the point where now we do have some swimmable days, but um, uh, it's very important for us to uh, keep our eyes on the prize and uh, focus on making sure that uh, we, we achieve that goal within the next three to five years. Next slide. So I will uh, conclude at this point um, uh, and uh, have my uh, contact information there. And uh, just want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, we um, uh, were put on a trash diet here in the city that helped us out tremendously. That was done by, uh, you know, EPA. And uh, as a result, we've moved to move tremendously forward. So you'll hear about some of the uh, progress and, and things that have been made, but I was, uh, I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to speak to you today and uh, look forward to answering some of your questions uh, when we get to that, that question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Let's see if we have Angie back, if she has unfrozen or been able to, uh, to call in. Thanks so much. Well, while we're, maybe you want to um, see if people have any questions of Dennis while we're getting sorted out. Have you seen Angie? I mean, have you seen uh, Ariel? Back? I am back. I am back. Great. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Sorry Hooray. about that. <laughs> That's okay. Welcome. Go Thank for you. it, Ariel. Okay, great. All right, Angie, if we could just have the next slide, or if it's easier, I can um, reach it. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Well, so thank you again for having me. So my name is Ariel Tron, and I am with the Anacostia Watershed Society. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that um, Dennis touched on, talk about, again, you know, some of our challenges on the river and some of the uh, recent success stories so that we can um, get the river swimmable and fishable by 2025, which is our goal. So if we can have the next slide, please. So we do, um, at the Infestia Watershed Society, so like Dennis said, we're fortunate that we have a lot of wonderful people and organizations working on the river. There's a lot of focus on the Anacostia. And so we do a lot of different things. Um, a lot of our programming is focused on education, on connecting people to the river. We work with um, K through 12 students. We also work with um, adults. We have some adult education programs. We also do stewardship programs, recreation programs, getting people out on the river. And then also, um, of course, advocacy. So advocating for um, some of the, the larger policy things that need to happen to get, get the river cleaned up. So if we can have the next slide, please. So just wanted to show the watershed. Of course, all of you I'm sure are very familiar with the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which you can see on the map there in the 
sort of seafoam green and then the Potomac watershed, kind of the lighter area, the lighter blue area, and then the little yellow area kind of right in the um, middle area of the watershed, that's the Anacostia watershed. So of course we're a sub watershed of the Potomac and the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and if you look at the next slide, kind of zooms in and shows you just the Anacostia watershed. So you can see um, that, that pink line there, which shows you the border of the Anacostia watershed. So you can see we have about the Eastern um, half, one third half of DC is in the Anacostia watershed. And then we have um, a good amount of both Prince George's County and Montgomery County in Maryland as well. And then of course, we have a lot of federal land, a lot of National Park Service land, as well as um, USDA land. We have the Arboretum and Belco Agricultural Research Center. So we have a lot of different jurisdictions that sort of have their hands um, on the land that, that forms our watershed. So if we look at the next slide. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the issues that we have, like Dennis said, you know, we have a lot of issues that face a lot of urban rivers. Of course, we have um, huge issues with stormwater runoff. It's a very urban watershed. We have lots of impervious surface. So that of course brings a lot of pollutants into the watershed trash, which Dennis mentioned. Nutrients, we don't have as much of an issue with nutrients in the Anacostia as we do in the larger um, Chesapeake Bay watershed, just because we don't have a lot of agriculture. We do of course have um, excess nutrients that come off of people's lawns. We certainly have a lot of lawns in our watershed. So we do get um, nutrient, excess nutrients that way. Um, sewage as well, which Dennis touched on and which I will go into a little bit more detail about in a second. And then of course, sediment and, and the toxins as well. So the next slide highlights the sewage, which Dennis mentioned. So this is something that, as you all know, faces a lot of urban rivers that we do um, have you know, historic issues with aging infrastructure and sewage getting into our waterways, which of course um, makes it so that they're not swimmable. And so in the Anacostia, we have both a combined sewer system in sort of the central part of the district in DC, which I'll show you on the um, next slide in a second here. So we have a combined sewer, which, um, you know, as Dennis said, and as I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with, right, that we have all of the wastewater as well as the stormwater going into the same set of pipes going to the treatment plant, which in our case is Blue Plains, and then, you know, of course getting treated and then released back into the river. And then we also have um, for the rest of the watershed, so for the Maryland portion of the water set, watershed, as well as kind of the um, more outer reaches of the district, we have um, an MS4, so separate storm sewer system where, you know, we have all the stormwater going directly into our, our streams and rivers and creeks, which of course brings its own set of challenges in terms of trash and anything that's on those surfaces getting washed directly into those streams. Um, but in theory, we don't have issues with sewage getting in because it's a separate set of pipes. Um, so if we can look at the next slide, you can see that um, this has been really one of the biggest success stories for the river um, is that the combined sewer overflows are being addressed through the Clean Rivers Project. And so this is something that, you know, when Anacostia Watershed Society was first formed, you know, back in 1989, with the goal of, you know, working to protect and restore the river, get it cleaned up so that people could swim and fish in the river again, right, and, and not worry about the, the health of the water. Obviously, one of the big things that needed to be tackled was these combined sewer overflows, right, which were happening about 50 times a year at that point. So it was about two billion gallons of that combined um, sewage and stormwater that was overflowing into the river. You can see that th there's also overflows. Um, some of those outfalls go into the Potomac and Rock Creek as well. Um, and so this is, you know, a, a district wide problem, but the Clean Rivers Project um, is what came out of that um, advocacy work. And so eventually um, it, was, it did become a lawsuit um, that AWS had against WASA, which at the time was the Washington Area Sewer Authority, which is now DC Water. And so they needed to reduce those overflows by 98% as part of that consent decree in the, the long-term control plan. And so they um, are doing the Clean Rivers Project. It is underway now. They finished um, the first tunnel. The first tunnel was finished in March, 2018. 
so a little bit over three years ago. And that first tunnel is um, the Anacostia tunnel. And so that's the one that is um, taking essentially a lot of those outfalls that were going into the Anacostia are now going into that first tunnel, that Anacostia tunnel. And that, um, that tunnel alone has reduced those overflows by 80%, which is awesome. So we're already seeing um, huge water quality improvements in the river um, because we have that first tunnel done. They're working on the next tunnel now, which kind of goes um, north from where the existing tunnel is. If you're familiar with BC, it kind of goes up towards Bloomingdale, up towards um, like McMillan, towards the reservoir. Um, and that will, will further reduce those overflows. So that's been huge. That's been um, a tremendous uh, improvement in terms of water quality, like I said, because we no longer have all of that sewage that's overflowing, all that combined, you know, sewage and stormwater overflowing into the river. So that's getting us um, a lot closer to that swimmable piece, reducing that bacteria. So if we look at the next slide, you can see that we have, you know, so that, so that combined sewer area, that is in the DC portion of the watershed. And as I said, in, you know, in Maryland, we have the MS4. So we have that separate storm sewer system. And you can see that a lot of our watershed is in Maryland, right? Over 70% of the watershed of that land area is in Maryland. And so um, what we found was that there was a lot of bacteria that was coming in from Maryland as well, because of like Dennis was saying, you know, aging infrastructure, pipes that were leaking, pipes that were broken, right? So we also have a consent decree with the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, WSSC, where they are um, essentially doing the maintenance on those pipes. So those two things are gonna have a really, really huge impact on getting us to the swimmable piece, on addressing that bacteria in the water. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that we have, um, this is what really gets us to the fishable piece, right? So of course we're working towards swimmable and fishable. The big challenge with swimmable is the bacteria. The big challenge with fishable is the legacy toxins that we have in the river. So as Dennis mentioned, we had some um, former industrial sites along the river, uh, the Washington Navy Yard, the Washington Gas site by the 11th Street Bridge, uh, and then the Kenilworth Landfill. So a number of these sites where there were, you know, of course, before the Clean Water Act, there was a lot of uh, stuff that was dumped into the river. And the Anacostia doesn't have very much flow to it, right? So it's a tidal river. So it just kind of slowly sloshes back and forth. So a lot of that stuff that was um, dumped in at that time just kind of settled to the bottom. So we have these hot spots where we have these legacy toxins in the sediment, not so much in the water column, but in the, in the sediment itself. And so um, there is a large project right now, it's called the Anacostia River Sediment Project, jointly led by the um, DC government, by the Department of Energy and Environment, and then the National Park Service. So it's a, a joint effort to really look at the whole river, essentially assess where those toxic hotspots are, and then figure out what's the best plan um, to clean it up. So that is an ongoing um, project. Like Dennis said, hopefully in the next three years, we can get all that um, addressed. There's an interim record of decision right now for some of the early hotspots that are going to start to get addressed in the next couple of years and then monitored and then, uh, you know, working towards that larger overall record of decision. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that, of course, as, as Dennis mentioned, and as we all know, this is a, unfortunately a problem in a lot of our rivers is trash, right? So technically this doesn't stop it from being swimmable and fishable, but this is an issue that you know we're we're constantly working on with with Dennis and with lots of other awesome partners who are working on doing trash cleanups along the river in the neighborhoods throughout the watershed to really you know reduce the amount of trash that's making its way out into the river. Um, on the next slide, you can see that in terms of you know the ways that we deal with the trash, um, like Risa mentioned at the beginning, we have some structural controls in terms of trash traps. And so awesome, I see in the chat clogging in Greenbelt. Awesome, yeah, every, every bit helps throughout the watershed, right? Um, and so trash cleanups are a huge part of it, right? These structural controls that we have, these trash traps on some of the tributaries that come into the river, you can see in this picture here, this is one that we have um, on a tributary called Nash Run, um, which flows into uh, Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. 
this is um, a trash trap that essentially you know traps the trash as it comes in um, and then we're able to collect the trash out of the trap and then sort it that's one of the benefits of a lot of these traps is of course that they're removing the trash right but also then that it's concentrated in one spot and we can sort it and collect data about what we're seeing right and so this one that we have in Nash Run, we've had it there for over 10 years and so we've been able to get a lot of data comparative data to be able to see you know what are a lot of the themes of what types of trash we're seeing and then ideally we can use that to advocate for you know legislation things like hopefully someday a bottle management bill right that's always sort of our our white whale it's how do we how do we address the bottles that are getting into our waterways right but like dennis said um we've had some great success with um managing some of the sources of the trash pollution with the bags um, that we have the bag bill. We also have a um, styrofoam ban now. We have a ban on polystyrene in DC, Prince George's County and Montgomery County for takeout containers. Um, so they need to be made out of um, biodegradable or compostable materials instead of styrofoam. So those are, you know, some of the things that we work on. And then of course we do um, cleanups with folks. And as part of those cleanups, try to inspire behavior change among people that hopefully, you know, if they see all those water bottles, maybe they're going to be inspired to use a reusable water bottle, right? We also do um, some art projects where we do murals on the storm drains to try to raise awareness that what goes down that drain is connected to the river. So use all kinds of different tools to try, try to reach people. So if we can see the next slide. So again, yeah, just to recap, you know, these are um, a lot of the issues that we face all coming back sort of to that stormwater issue. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we do in terms of uh, stormwater management. So that's another area of focus that we have is trying to, of course, reduce stormwater volume coming in. So we do um, a lot of green infrastructure projects. We do, we do demonstration projects. So we do them at schools or at houses of worship, right? We try to do them in highly visible areas where we can partner with an entity that you know is going to be able to use that um, green infrastructure installation, and, you know, have some signage and be able to educate the community about it. So we have a number of different programs where we where we work on that. Um, the River Smart program in the district, we partner um, with the district government on that to do that. River Smart communities, which is focused on um, churches and houses of worship, River Smart schools. Um, trying to have these devices to uh, obviously manage the stormwater, but also use them as an educational opportunity. So if we look at the next slide, you can see, so again, just bioretention, right, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, right, just, you know, using plants, having these engineered features to be able to manage the stormwater in place, right? A lot of times we want to try to deal with these problems before they get out to the river, right? We get such a huge volume of water that comes into the Anacostia when it rains because we have um, so much runoff. So the more we can do to try to have places where that water can soak into the ground and be treated in place, the better. And on the next slide, you can see um, some examples of some bioretention projects. You can see these are at um, some schools. So as part of the um, treating and teaching program that we do with Prince George's County Public Schools, having these features you know, near the playgrounds, we can have some signage, the students can sort of learn a little bit about, about stormwater while, while they're outside. So on the next slide. Yeah. Looks like we might have had another freeze with Ariel. She has a number to call in. While we're while we're waiting for, I wonder if Dennis is still there. Uh, yes, you, I am. Yeah, if you could talk about the bag tax and the effects that you've um, seen from that. Uh, sure. Um, well, uh, With and, the bag and, and I, and you back on Ariel? Oh, okay. No, one of the things I like to point out, uh, and and this ref and you just referred to it as the bag tax. And that's one of the things I like to clear up for folks because it's not really a tax, it's a fee. Right. Right. Uh, and the reason that it's not a tax is because uh, people have a, a choice of, of whether to uh, 
take a bag and have to pay for a bag. Well, they could bring their own re right. recyclable bag and not have to pay that fee uh, whatsoever. So, but that um, um, uh, five cents uh, fee on on bags has uh, uh, generated a um, a fund that is used uh, for for the specific purpose of. Uh, uh, cleaning up the Anacostia, whether that's supporting our uh, environmental education, uh, supporting the various nonprofit organizations uh, who sponsor cleanups and, and things of that nature, and, uh, and other things that um, fortunately uh, we've been able to uh, be able to sustain some of the work through, uh, through that fund. And one of the things about that is that uh, it's not a money generating um, uh, function. Uh, it's primarily designed to change behavior. So uh, that's the real goal of, uh, of the five cents bag fee. So hopefully one day uh, it will uh, be a diminishing fund that will go down to zero because we don't have a need to, um, for people to uh, 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 pay for bags that, that are discarded. But um, uh, again, that was in that was passed in 2012, and uh, since that time, I think it's averaged um, uh, over uh, between three to six million dollars annually uh, that goes toward um, uh, river cleanup. This is Ariel. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I can, I'm on the phone, so I can't see the um, screen, but if you want to go to the um, muscle restoration slide, which should be the next slide. We're there now? Yep, we are there. Okay, great. So just wanted to touch a little bit um, on another initiative that we've recently started working on because, again, you know, we... Uh, it's taken a long time to sort of get our, our urban rivers to, to the point where they are and, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of different types of pollution. And so, you know, we always like to say that we're going to need a lot of different strategies and tools to restore them as well. So we're always looking at what are new things, what are new strategies we can try. And we've recently been working on freshwater muscle restoration. Of course, we um, the Anacostia is, a, is freshwater, so we don't have oysters. Um, but we do, historically, there were a lot of freshwater mussels, and we are working on restoring that population. Mussels can restore, I mean, not restore, but they can filter between 10 and 20 gallons a day, each mussel. So they are prolific. They are great filter feeders in getting a lot of the nutrients out of the water, as well as the sediment. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, which talks about wild mussel surveys, that was how we kind of started on the mussel restoration was just seeing, we knew historically that there were mussels in the river and we anecdotally found one um, in 2012 when we were fishing, um, caught one on a fishing rod, actually a hook got caught on one of the mussels. And so then we started doing wild mussel surveys just to kind of see what the population was, how many different species there were, um, and then, you know, see if we could uh, work to restore that population. And so uh, on this project. So we work, um, we have a partnership with Prince George's County Public Schools and um, with their high school students um, that they study mussels as part of their. And so they come out and help us do surveys to see what we can find. Um, and we actually record different species in the river, which, which is pretty good. Um, and so we're very encouraged by that. And so what we're doing now is we are doing a study to see where along the river they do the best, the mussels do the best, um, and then working on a freshwater mussel restoration plan to increase their numbers. So we work with the um, Harrison Lake Catchery in Virginia, not far from many of you, and um, we collect the females, the gravid females from the Anacostia, and then they culture the juveniles for us. And then if you go to the next slide, um, which should say um, floating baskets, that is we then have the juveniles in these floating baskets, the juvenile mussels, um, we have 200 per basket of a um, couple different species that we're experimenting with um, at, at different locations along the river, again, so that we can measure their growth and we can see where they're doing the best um, and then ultimately hopefully release them and establish some um, freshwater mussel beds again. So the next slide, 
um, shows just the monitoring work that we do with the muscles. So um, we go out and we monitor them monthly. And again, we do that with students um, from Prince George's County Public Schools, as well as with volunteers in the summer when the, when the students aren't in session. Um, and this is helping us to gain, you know, a better picture of um, where we can go next with freshwater um, muscle restoration, because we hope that they can be sort of part of the puzzle as we work on the restoration. And I just have um, a couple more slides here. So on the next slide, you can see, um, I should say, youth education. And so we do, um, as Dennis mentioned, you know, outdoor education, and as you all know, is, is really important to getting people out on our rivers, sort of cultivating that appreciation for our rivers. So we do a lot of education programs with students where we do class visits, go into the classroom, or, or these days go into the Zoom room and um, do different um, lessons with them that way. We bring them out on the river to do a boat trip, and then they all do some kind of restoration project with us, whether that's, you know, working with the mussels or whether it's coming out to do a planting. Um, you can see in the, the one picture there with the red bucket, we also do a um, an American shad restoration project where the students raise the shad fry in their classroom and then bring them out to the river. So lots of different um, restoration projects, but all with that sort of same format of doing classwork with the students and then um, a boat trip on the river so they can see the river and then um, some type of, of restoration project. And then the next slide talks about um, some of our adult education programs. So um, we run two sort of semester long programs, one, the Watershed Stewards Academy, um, which focuses on, again, adults it's in the evenings and on Saturdays equipping people with, you know, knowledge about the river, connections to local resources, so that then at the end they can do a capstone project, which is something that's um, in their community, which could be something um, tangible. It could be like putting in a garden, putting in a rain garden or, or rain barrels, or it can be an education thing. You know, maybe they um, do a workshop with their church or um, another steward recently did another mural project. Um, and then the Master Naturalist Program, again, doing everything we can to get increase the uh, constituency of people working to help protect and restore the river. And then on the next slide, which I believe is the last slide, um, just kind of talks about opportunities to, to get involved. I know that um, a lot of you are not necessarily local to D.C., but if you are ever in the area, we have lots of different volunteer events and, and boat tours out on the river. We do um, Watershed Wednesday happy hours, which we've been doing virtually lately. So even if you're not in D.C., you could potentially tune in for some of those. And then again, as I mentioned, our um, our education program. So that is um, my last slide on the um, last slide. I think maybe there's one more actually with the picture of the river that has my my email, my contact information if you have questions or want to follow up. Well, thank you, Ariel. Thank you, both of you. Thanks, Dennis, for um, jumping in with the bag conversation because that's that's been a really important project too. We have a, a question or two kind of related questions. James Vonner says, great outreach. What age students do you get in the field? And then how many students in schools are you able to connect with for muscle outreach education? Yeah, so for the um, muscle program, we work with um, high school students. And so this year we have eight high schools that are participating from Prince George's County. And so it's, a, it's around 500 students that are participating. Um, it is virtual this year um, as the students are not come out in person. So we've been doing a lot of uh, virtual stuff with them, but the, the teachers actually still have the muscles. Normally we give them muscles to have in their classroom to do the monitoring before they bring them out. And so the teachers actually have them at their houses right now and are doing um, some monitoring and, and stuff. We gave them some cameras um, so they can kind of live stream that to, to the students. So yeah, so that program um, currently has eight high schools, about 500 students in Prince George's County. And then in DC, we're working with um, four schools, four muscle schools, and those are actually um, younger students. They are, um, two of them are second grade, one of them's third grade, and one of them is fifth grade. So that's another about um, 250 students. That's awesome. Um, another question. Thank you. Um, oh, James mentioned 500 schools. So awesome. We are doing some similar thing, 
themed work on mid with middle school students on the James would love to connect. So maybe you guys can do that afterwards. Um, That'd be great. So for, from Judy, can you describe challenges and success of the adult programs in reaching out to non-traditional urban communities? Challenges yeah, I would success. say. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. OK. Um, I would say that, um, interestingly, during the time of COVID, you know, we have had to do those programs virtually as well. And, you know, we initially thought that we wouldn't have as many, um, you know, that we would have trouble getting the numbers. And we actually had, normally we have about 20 people per class. We try to keep it at about 20. And last spring, we had 37 people in the in the Watershed Stewards Academy, I think, because people were just, you know, wanting to do something. Um, and so I think that in terms of outreach and, you know, um, we tried to partner with other organizations to do that outreach as well so that, you know, there may, maybe they're seeing it on our website or maybe they're seeing it through social media, but then maybe they're also seeing it through another organization that they know or maybe through their church or maybe through their student school or maybe they're seeing a, you know, a flyer at, at the rec center. So just trying to have it in um, publicizing it as many different places as possible so that people are seeing it from multiple um, sources, I think, has been one thing that's worked well for us. Yeah, I'll also say that um, one of the things that we've done that's really helped a lot with the uh, outreach and advocacy in the uh, uh, region or the area is uh, there's an organization that was formed called the Anacostia Park and Community Collaborative. And uh, it's um, not necessarily okay. just targeted on um, the river, uh, but it's, the river is central to the uh, uh, group's work and efforts. And uh, this uh, particular collaborative is made up of non-traditional uh, organizations that um, may be community serving organizations in various ways, but just have not been uh, a part of the um, uh, work being done directly on the natural resources and things of that nature. So it's been an excellent opportunity to um, engage um, uh, people and residents and uh, groups who, as I said, were not traditionally um, involved with this kind of work. So the Anacostia Park and Community Collaborative is uh, now, I think, uh, uh, is, is into about maybe three years uh, operating and is uh, really uh, doing a great job of reaching uh, the adult populations in the area. Dennis, do you think this is from when, when it reaches a collaborative of groups that are non-traditional or would not normally, might not have gotten together 15 years ago or so. Do you think there's sort of like a, um, a tipping point? There's been so much work on the Anacostia. So many people who are residents now know about it. It doesn't seem like a fringe tree hugger, nuts and berries thing, but it seems like something that's a community thing instead. Do you think it's something, a function of something like that? Because it's awesome. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's really having a, a, a great impact on um, uh, informing, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the wide, wider community, because uh, I'll just give you one example. Um, two of the organizations that are part of this particular collaborative, uh, one is located in uh, Ward, the Ward 8 uh, area, one is located mm -hmm. in Ward 7. Uh, the Ward 7 group is called the East River Family Strengthening Collaborative. And the Ward 8 is the Far Southeast uh, Family Strengthening Collaborative. And uh, th th those two uh, organizations uh, provide a lot of social services. Uh, they fill a lot of gaps, you know, that the, that the municipal government misses uh, as it relates to uh, serving uh, the direct services to the people in the communities and, and the neighborhoods. And so to bring them in and uh, get them, uh, have them become informed about um, the, the, the work we're doing uh, in the, on the river, in the river and around the watershed uh, has, has been tremendous because then they become advocates uh, for, for that work and, uh, and, and then the beat goes on. So yes, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's had a tremendous impact. Mm -hmm. So Dennis, can I follow up with that? So when you're talking about um, the eighth ward, are you talking about um, 
low income and those that don't have traditional access to internet and cell service, because we have a large group of those folks and trying to reach those folks is really difficult. Yes, um, and, and, and again, um, I mean, that was one of the uh, primary goals of Groundwork Anacostia was to, uh, you know, reach deep into those communities. The, uh, the uh, communities that the wards located on the east side of the city, Ward 7 and Ward 8, is where um, the, the predominant prop population are uh, people of color, um, African-Americans, Latino, and uh, also uh, is where uh, the largest uh, uh, concentration of public housing is located, uh, as well as uh, uh, lower income. So people on the lower, in, uh, lower uh, part of the socioeconomic ladder. So absolutely, the, uh, uh, bringing these uh, uh, organizations into a collaborative operation with, um, say, like the Watershed Society and the traditional um, uh, Sierra Clubs and the uh, Audubon societies and others has just been a tremendous way of of informing and, and getting the word out, building stewardship in the in the on the ground uh, uh, communities. Any other questions? We have a, we're a little bit ahead of time, but I'm happy to entertain other questions. I have one more. I'd love to get Dennis's contact. Mm -hmm. um, to throw some ideas at them and see what might help us move forward in our current environment over here. If I can do that. No, absolutely. <laughs> oh, there you go. Got it, Judy. And Dennis put his number and, in there too. Yeah, and I added my yeah. number. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing, uh, uh, Risa, if I could just point out to sure. uh, everyone who's listening, um, and and in all of 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 our discussions, I, I, I really like to uh, really bring people into understanding the. Uh, uh, the, the political structure of Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, you may have heard recently there's uh, efforts to, uh, for D.C. to become a state. But um, for uh, D.C. is, a, I call it a city state that has been operating, uh, um, you know, here in the, in the center of the metropolitan area, uh, doing all of those kinds of uh, functions that are generally state functions, but at the same time operating uh, a municipal government all of this while having no um, uh, uh, representation in Congress uh, to be able to impact the uh, way the money is spent or, or those other kinds of things. And uh, this has also had a tremendous um, impact on uh, what it has taken to get things done here. So uh, my hat's off to all of the progress that uh, has been made uh, uh, up to this point. Uh, considering the fact that um, up until, uh, you know, the, the 1970s, uh, D.C. Uh, was, was, didn't have what they call home rule uh, or uh, 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 didn't have uh, even a, a elected, uh, an elected mayor or, or a city council for the city. So I just wanted to point that out just mm -hmm. to kind of context everything for everyone. Just to make things a little extra difficult. <laughs> having no, no governmental structure. Yeah. Well, um, Ariel, any last words? We can wrap up here. No, no, thank you very much. Thank you for having us today. And, and I hope that um, my contact information shows up on that last slide. If anyone has additional questions, feel free to reach out. And if you're ever in DC and want to go out on the river, we're always doing tours. So give us a call. Yep, they have a cool pontoon boat. Eric can drive you around. So thank right. you. Thank you guys both so much. And um, we appreciate the work you've done and know you'll continue to be working on the Anacostia. 
Thanks so much. Yes, thank you for inviting right. us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. See you soon. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.